Greetings and welcome this morning to our service. It's uh, lovely to have you here as we gather in the house of the Lord. Today uh, we are going to be celebrating Holy Communion in the service. Uh, We'll talk a little bit more about that just now. Um, But we are going to participate in a call to worship today that is going to be on the screens in front of you. And uh, we're going to ask you to respond with the bold print. Um, So I will say the leader bits, then I'll ask you to respond with the all. You who are poor, why have you come? To hear the good news. To hear the good news. You who are broken hearted, why have you come? To hear our hearts. You who are captive, why have you come? To hear words of freedom. You who are prisoners, why have you come? To be released from what binds us. You who mourn, why have you come? To receive comfort. Then you are welcome here in this place, at this table where Jesus offers blessings for all. Friends, we are going to sing our first hymn uh, this morning, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Let us bow our heads as we offer up our opening prayers. Let us pray. (laughs) Loving and gracious God, we come before you to give thanks for what you have done for us. We celebrate your name and offer you praise because of your holiness. Yet you are a living God in whom we trust and believe. We thank you, God, for 
the rainy season, and for our health. O oh God, we thank you for the life that we have, for the air that we breathe, and for our relationships with those who are both close and far away. We thank you for your infinite goodness, which deepens our trust in you. God of mercy, increase our faith, so that we may develop a deeper understanding of you and a deeper relationship with you. Gracious God, you know us better than we know ourselves. There are countless times when we have sinned against you and our neighbour. Have mercy on us and forgive us. Consciously or unconsciously, through our words, attitudes and actions, we have broken our relationship with you, with our neighbours and even with the environment. Have mercy on us and forgive us, O Lord. Restore, O gracious God, our broken relationships and guide us in your paths for your glory and for the building of your kingdom. Have mercy on us and forgive us. Friends, listen to these words of pardon. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. May the mercy, may the God of mercy, who forgives you of all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. For we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, our scripture readings that find us this morning, the first of those is the Old Testament reading taken from the book of Exodus. And we're going to be reading from Exodus chapter 12, verses 21 through until the end of 32. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go, select lambs for your families, and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood in the basin. None of you shall go outside the door of your house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike down the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over that door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you down. You shall observe this right as a perpetual ordinance for you and your children. When you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this observance. And when your children ask you, what do you mean by this observance? You shall say, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord, for he passed over the houses of the Israelites. In Egypt, when he struck down the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed down and worshipped. And the Israelites went and did just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. 
At midnight, the Lord struck down all of the firstborn in the land of Egypt, and from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner, who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. Pharaoh arose in the night, he and all his officials, and all the Egyptians, and there was a loud cry in Egypt. For there was not a house without someone dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron in the night and said, Rise up and go away from my people, both you and the Israelites. Go, worship the Lord as you said. Take your flocks and your herds as you said and be gone and bring a blessing on me too. And then we pick up from the gospel according to St. Mark chapter 14. And we're going to be reading a selection of verses from verse 12 through 17 and then picking up again from verse 22 through until the end of 24. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples sent out and went to the city and found everything as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover meal. And when it was evening, he came to the twelve. While they were eating, he took half a loaf of bread and, after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take this my body. And then he took the cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. May God bless the hearing of his word to us today. Barbara Brown Taylor, one of my favorite authors, she wrote uh, something on her Facebook page this week that went a little bit like this. The last 16 months have been hell for a lot of people. I know some who took their sick relatives to the emergency room and never saw them alive again. I know small business owners who kept everyone on the payroll and watched their savings run through their fingers like rain. I know two people who killed themselves because they ran out of hope. The two things that struck me about what Barbara wrote about on Facebook were these two. First, the devastation of admitting somebody that you love to hospital, never being able to visit them or see them, and then receiving the news that they had passed away. The second thing that struck me was how Barbara phrased the two suicides that she had experienced or were known to her with the phrase that they ran out of hope. And it got me thinking, are we in danger of running out of hope? Are we in danger of running out of hope? I began to ask myself, where do we find hope? Where do I begin to look for hope? 
Can we prevent ourselves from running out of hope by doing something or placing ourselves somewhere? Is there something that you and I can do in order to not run out of hope? Are there things that we can do to keep hope alive? One of the significant traits about Christianity, along with other religions, is the fact that history is very important to us. The story of how we came to be is of great value for both how it started and our origins of what we believe, but also about the past actions of God and how he acts even in our lives today. What he's capable of doing in the past and what he is capable of doing in our futures. Can memory bring us hope for the future? Can memories, can the story give us hope for the future? Today we're going to be celebrating Holy Communion. And I want us to pause for a moment and look back at the 1250 BC. Moses has already been called through the burning bush. God has called him to set the Israelites free from the captives of Egypt. They're slaves. They're living in a foreign land and things are not good. Moses demands from Pharaoh that the people be set free. As we know the story, Pharaoh is not interested in letting go his forced labor. They're valuable for they are doing the horrible tasks they're building the city. There's no ways that Pharaoh is about to let his, these people go. And as we follow the story, God, through Moses, doesn't give up. And so we hear about all these different plagues and bad things that Moses, through God, is sent upon the Egyptians. I almost reckon that God is getting more and more impatient as he goes along. And so each time he seems to up the ante. We've done nine plagues and God is irritated. And so as a final straw, he decides that something drastic has to happen in order for the Israelites to be freed from Egyptian rule. And so we hear from our story today in Exodus about this particular event. Each family is called to go and find a young unblemished lamb, to slaughter it, to drain the blood of that animal into a basin. Moses through God instructs them to take the branch of a hyssop and to dip it in the blood and to paint it onto the lintel and to the door, two doorposts, instructing them that once that has been done, no one should leave the house. They would then take that lamb and cook it for them to eat and for them to share a meal with one another. The story goes that that night, the angel of death, some of the commentators say whether it was an epidemic, which I could relate to, came through the land and killed the firstborn, more than likely male, of both families, of both humans, as well as 
their livestock. And no one was spared from this. All the way from the palace, Pharaoh's palace, to those who were prisoners in the dungeon. We're told that they wake up with a loud cry, wailing, and finally that seems to get Pharaoh to stand up and listen and let the people go. Now, this could have been a one-time event, a thing where God intervened and did this, and that was the end of that. But God gives the people a command that at the same time, every year going forward, they must participate in this act of killing a young lamb, unblemished lamb, and share a meal with their families in order to remind them of what happened, but more importantly, what God did for them. And so for 600 years, this ritual has been passed down from generation to generation. 600 years later, in 586, 87 BC, the Israelites are plundered and taken over by the Babylonians. Many of them are killed. Many of them become prisoners of war. And if you didn't fall into those two categories, you were then packed up and shipped off to Babylon to be resettled in a land that was not Cana and was not the Lord's. And again, you were to become slaves of the Babylonian people. One of the commentators asked this question to say, I wonder whether the Israelite people living as captive slaves in Babylon still celebrated Passover. Did they celebrate Passover? My response is this, that they would have absolutely celebrated it. Because more than ever, they needed the reminder of what God had done for them previously. In generations, way before that. They needed to hold on to that Passover meal in order to give them hope that God could release them once again from captivity. We're not sure whether they celebrated it, whether they recalled the story. There's no evidence, there's nothing that tells us that. But what did happen it was during that Babylonian captivity that the priests wrote down the story of Exodus from Egypt. The script that we read today has been preserved all the way back from 586 BC where the priests decided that it was important to begin to record the story and the acts of what God had done. I venture to say that those Israelites celebrated Passover harder than they had ever before. The Israelites are in a strange land. 
They despised and scattered all over this country. Do they continue to celebrate the Passover in a foreign land? The story, as we know, doesn't end there. Fast forward another 500 years. All sorts of things happen. The Israelites are released. They live their their lives a little longer in other lands. And finally, we get to our gospel narrative of Jesus. And you know something? When Jesus and his disciples sit down to celebrate the Passover meal, as recorded in the Gospels, on that fateful night, the Israelites are slaves and captives of Rome. Again, they are recalling the events that God can and does redeem his people. And so sitting at that table, Jesus, with his disciples, Jesus decides to take the known elements of that meal that is so ingrained in the Jewish tradition of promise, of hope, of remembering of the past. And he takes those ordinary elements And he transforms them into something that we have today. The disciples are unaware of the words spoken. They don't have an understanding of what Jesus is saying. That Jesus is going to die. And not just that he is going to die, but that he is going to bring eternal life and a once-off freedom for all of us. And so, 2,000 years later, fast forward to us. Something that stretches 3,000, nearly 500 years still has an impact on our lives today. As we recall God's action in our lives and all the past generations that have gone before us. We participate in this ritual and sacrament of Holy Communion. And as we do so, it is worth being reminded of the liberation of Moses and the Hebrews from political and economic powerlessness. As well as the liberation that Jesus brings from death, sin, and evil through his dying on the cross. That is our hope. That God, through all these many generations, has never abandoned us, has never left us, but that has called us to reflect continually on his actions. Sometimes this meal is referred to as the Eucharist. That is taken from the Greek word Eucharistine, which means thanksgiving. It's a meal of giving thanks to God for his continued faithfulness to us. We call it communion, which is derived from the Latin word meaning union with, together, all together with God, 
we celebrate this meal. Communion is about remembering, remembering, remembering all that God has done for us. It's also about remembering us. Where we become members once again as we learn to trust in God for the future. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, we are going to participate in the... I am going to participate in communion this morning, and I'll tell you in a short while. But we are going to sing first as we sing, Tell Out My Soul. Friends 
on that faithful night as Jesus and the disciples <coughs> sat together for the last time at the table. Jesus presented these elements, ordinary elements of bread and wine who were already placed on our table. And in that meal, he took the bread and the wine and he said it should be set apart from all common use to this holy use and mystery. He took these elements and he blessed them, transforming them into something more than they were already, into something that is holy, into something that sustains our journey in this life. Today, my friends, we are going to witness that as we gather together. Come, let us bow our heads as we <coughs> pray to the Lord. Let us pray. Holy God, source of all being, you are greater by far than our human thoughts can comprehend. With all that you have created, you abide, weeping with us in grief and pain, rejoicing with us in life and love. You are everywhere in this moment, holding a variety of living experience and weaving us together in the great an intricate tapestry of creation. Creator God, Father, and Mother of us all, in your holy love you took on our limitations, born of a body bound within a body. You know the whole of this human experience, learning to communicate with words teaching us to communicate with presence, learning the fears that wring us up dry, teaching us of the love that nurtures us back to life. Everlasting God, you are everywhere and right here, right now. As close as the air we breathe, the air which binds one another and all to your beautiful creation. You're as close as the sunlight on our skin, as close as the rain that drops from our hair, and the wind and the water that push us and lead us and call us again, again, and again into relationship with one another and with you. Holy Spirit, Advocate, Guide, encourage us Stir our hearts that we may speak anew the familiar words of this sacrament. So, Heavenly Father, we ask that you would transform these ordinary elements, filled with your spirit, into the bread, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, and this wine into the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we offer up these prayers in your precious name. Amen. Friends, according to the old story, it goes like this, that Jesus, seated around the table with his disciples, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread or drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Friends, we had a malfunction of our communion cups this morning and uh, we are not able to share the sacrament 
with you and so I will partake of the elements. It is, it is not something that we would do, it's certainly not Presbyterian in any way, but we ask for your grace this morning as um, we are living in these unprecedented times and um, we don't want any of you to get sick during this time. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ is broken for you. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ is shed for you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, no matter where we find ourselves, where we are in our lives, no matter what we're going through or experiencing at this time. It is in remembering and in gathering together as your community that you offer us sustenance. You offer us love and hope. And so, Lord, as we part from this place, and we go our separate ways. We ask that your spirit would renew us from the inside out. That you would give us the courage and strength to face whatever the week may hold for us. Lord, that you would call us to be your hands and your feet. So, Lord, I call upon you to bless each person here who is present and those who are joining us online. For we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, we take this moment to remember those others in our prayers who uh, before we do that let's do the offering I apologize <laughs> <coughs> listen to these words as they call forth the offering we have more to offer than we recognize or realize God has given us abundant gifts let us faithfully respond to your generous to our generous God by presenting our tithes and our offerings. Friends, we are grateful to all of those who continue to support and love us during this time and for your offerings that are being placed both in the plate and uh, made electronically into our bank account. Let us pray for those gifts. Holy God, how often we take for granted all that we have. How often we fail to recognize how blessed we truly are. Take these gifts that we give in response to your generosity and use them to further Christ's mission and ministry in a hurting world. For we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Friends, we're going to take a moment and remember our world as we pray and lift up the prayers for those who are in desperate need of love, sustenance, and encouragement during this time. Let us pray our prayers for the people. God of mercy, the earth groans as wildfires rage. Hurricanes destroy and our climate continues to warm and change. We are weary of disaster, O oh God. We are tense from concern and fear. We feel helpless as we watch the evening's news. Hear us, O oh God, as we share ourselves, our prayers and our hopes with you. Bless us, O oh God, with a reverent sense of your presence as we lift up these petitions before you. 
Lord, we pray for our nation and our nation's leaders. In this time of turmoil, come near, holy God, to both judge and save us. When we turn away from your help, help us to repent and to return to you. May our leaders be led by your wisdom. May they clearly discern your will and seek to follow it. Lord, we pray for the suffering all across our globe. We pray for peace to reign in Afghanistan. For the Afghani people to enjoy the freedom and dignity that they deserve. We pray for mercy for the people of Haiti. For respite from their endless woes. For prosperity for a country desperate to make their way. We pray for all those who must endure violence, destruction and abuse. Save us, O oh God, from sectarian thinking that leads us to believe others' problems are not our own. Remind us of all our interconnectedness, that the suffering of some is the suffering of us all. Almighty and merciful God, we praise you for sending healing and hope through doctors and nurses and researchers who bless us with new science and technology to serve and save us. We claim your promise of wholeness to all who suffer. We glorify you for your constant presence, help and hope. May your word and all who live in it be renewed through the power of the risen Christ, who's committed to being Christ's hands and feet in a hurting world. God of grace, hear us as we join together in one voice and say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, we pray that you have been renewed in strength and hope and courage as we've joined together in our service today. Listen to these words of benediction and blessing. As you leave this place, remember that you do not go alone. God is close at hand. He hears the cries of all who call on his name. He honors those who honor him listening to their prayers and coming to their aid. So go from here with joy and confidence to love and to serve God and one another. Amen.
Ja, 